tener la clave de contarla amb, 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 el, amb el professor eh, Michael Chappell i, 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 i bueno, parlarà sobre, sobre aquesta interessant, eh, aquesta interessant recerca que ell porta a terme des de fa eh, molts anys eh, com, a, com a persona interessada i, i, i molt coneixedora de, del cos humà i de les seves eh, formes de representació i de la història de les mateixes eh, al llarg de, 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 de tota l'època eh, moderna i contemporània. <coughs> well, eh, and, and this, is, this is, it's a pleasure uh, uh, for me to, to introduce uh, Michael Chapol because uh, well, uh, I, 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 met her, I met him uh, um, well, several times uh, in, in, in our uh, professional and academic life in, in the last years and and it has been uh, for me a very important person in order uh, to understand uh, uh, the, the body, uh, the, 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 the human anatomy, uh, specifically in, 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 in Popular Anatomical Museum. And, and this was perhaps one, one of the, the first uh, um, um, ideas uh, that we connected in order to, 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 to make a speech uh, here, but uh, um, well, my, um, as, as you know, uh, uh, Professor Michael Sapol well, is, is, a, is a, um, a person very, uh, uh, is, is, a, is a, a scholar in, in, in this kind of uh, matters related to, to, the, to the history of the, of the human anatomy and, and its representation. And, and in fact, uh, this, will, this will be the, the, the main subject of, of the conference today. Uh, I, I would like to, to, to to introduce the, uh, um, uh, Professor Sapol uh, through uh, his uh, works, uh, because uh, in, in some way uh, I, I, can, I, I want uh, you, you, you notice the, the importance uh, of the um, studies of the human anatomy in the, in the career of uh, Professor Sapol. So, uh, mm, in, in the year, well, uh, Professor Sapol is, is, uh, um, is, is, a, is a person that at the same time is, is a historian, a historian of medicine, and at the same time is a, is, 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 is a curator. It's a, it's a man that uh, has uh, uh, done a lot of research uh, in order to make exhibitions. Uh, and this is something very interesting uh, uh, here, especially for me, because uh, as, as you know, I, I work as a historian and at the same time as, as a curator. And, 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 and this is very important because uh, he's, uh, uh, he has a, a, a quite, uh, a, a, a very important uh, knowledge uh, of uh, the material culture, um, not, not only related to texts. Uh, and and this, is, this is a, a very important uh, thing uh, for historians that uh, are interested in the material culture of science. So uh, one of the uh, uh, sites of uh, his uh, professional career was devoted to exhibitions, to making exhibitions. And, and here you have uh, uh, some examples of this uh, exhibition. In, t in 2003, uh, he created uh, Dream Anatomy. And uh, I think uh, one, one year later, uh, he, 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 he wrote uh, the catalog uh, Visionary Anatomies, uh, which was uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, a, a book, uh, the catalog of an exhibition, uh, a traveling exhibition uh, for the Smithsonian Institution, National Academy of Sciences, and, and well, it was a, that, that, that it's a, 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 a very interesting uh, catalog about uh, this, this divide, this division between art, science, and, and, the, and the changing representations uh, of, of, of anatomical representation from, from uh, the uh, 16th century to, to um, the, the, 20, the 21st century. Well, uh, this is another uh, interesting uh, exhibition uh, uh, he curated in, in the year 2006. It was devoted to, to the history of uh, forensic uh, medicine. And, and he was, uh, in this case, interested in in representations of the of the human anatomy from this uh, particular point of view, uh, as you know, this is a, a, a discipline, a medical discipline, created in the in the 19th century. Well, uh, following this this uh, 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 
a lot in, in, the, in, in the year 2009 that uh, situated uh, with uh, <coughs> uh, Paul Sherman, uh, this uh, exhibition uh, about um, uh, Darwin and, and, and the book of nature. Well, this is another, another uh, aspect of, of the life of uh, uh, Michael Chappell, which is also very interesting. And, and it's, uh, th this, this is a, a, a project that uh, Medical Movies on the Web uh, that was launched uh, in, in the year 2013, but uh, the project was uh, founded in, 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 a, in several exhibitions uh, he curated in, in the years at the beginning of the uh, 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 of this century, in the years 2003, uh, four and five, uh, uh, he curated some uh, uh, field program exhibitions, uh, uh, which were devoted to, to uh, difficult uh, medical films, uh, chiropractic uh, cinema, and, and strong medicine. And, and this, this is a very, very interesting project in which uh, uh, Professor Chapol, uh, David Panther, and, and, and another uh, uh, group of uh, people, a, a, a very, uh, well, well, a, a, a vast uh, team of uh, people, uh, work in, in, in a project that uh, is devoted to, to, to offer the, the people to see uh, 7,000 uh, medical films, and, and, and they, they uh <coughs> They select these films. They they uh, they cast expert commentaries uh, on on every film, and they uh, try to set uh, to set uh, uh, every film in in his historical context, in his historical context. And, and well, I think that this is a, a, a very important uh, uh, work, and, and 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 I think th this is uh, also very interesting uh, for for us here because uh, it's uh, it's another proof of this kind of. Uh, uh, kind of job that uh, uh, historians or this kind of historians curators do uh, and, and consisting of offering uh, for free to, to the people uh, amounts of uh, resources in order to, to do uh, mm, what, what you want. Uh, di didactic uh, uh, teaching, uh, 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 scholar uh, research, um, and, and so on. Well, um, moreover, uh, uh, he's, he, uh, he, he has another side uh, of uh, um, professional, uh, um, an academic uh, career in, in his career. Um, well, in fact, the, er, everything is connected in, 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 his, in his life. Uh, um, this, this, this is uh, one of uh, his books, and, and this, this was uh, published in, in the year 2000, 2002, uh, but uh, well, in fact it was the result of a doctoral uh, PhD thesis uh, that uh, he wrote in 1997 <coughs> in, in Columbia University. And well, this is, this is a, 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 master, a masterpiece uh, of uh, um, um, the, the politics uh, of uh, anatomy in the United States in, 19, in the 19th century. This is a, this is a, a, a compulsory book if you want to understand uh, uh, the politics of anatomy in that country, but it is also absolutely uh, uh, important for, for us, uh, for, for, for people of, of other countries, in order to understand uh, how uh, uh, physiologies and anatomies in the 19th century were built in order to, to, to create uh, that uh, uh, bourgeois uh, society. <coughs> well, uh, another interesting book uh, uh, he published uh, in, in, a, in a coedition with, uh, um, with Stephen Wright in, 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 two, in 2010 uh, was this, uh, this, this uh, cultural history of the, of the human body. As you can see, ev uh, the, the human body is, is always uh, present, is always uh, taking part in, in, the, in, in all the works of, uh, of Michael Chappell and, and the representations of that. Uh, um, this is, this is a, 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 a very important uh, feature of uh, his, uh, 
Okay, well, thank you so much, Alphonse. It's a pleasure to be here in your beautiful city. I was here just last year in 1993 playing in a very noisy and uh, hard to listen to rock band called Crack House. Clubs and we stayed up all night and then I became quite intoxicated. So, under entirely different uh, auspices, I'm here. Thanks. Welcome to Anatomy of Photography, which is my current thing. A uh, work in progress, a bit rough in spots, as you will see, and a bit of a mess. And I'll 
my plan is to do a show and tell, uh, provoke you with images, lots of images. Uh, see what sticks. Before we get underway, uh, I am obliged to warn you that uh, I'm going to show photographic images of dead human beings who were anatomically dissected or sliced to make cross sections or peeled or taken apart in some other way. Some of these images are not pretty. In fact, that's going to be a big portion of my discussion here. Uh, these are images that demonstrate that we are creatures made of meat and bone and skin and full of parts and textures and shapes and fluids. Uh, in some cases, faces and genitals will be visible, uh, even though none of the anatomized subjects ever gave their consent to be photographed and displayed. Now, if that makes you feel too uncomfortable, probably not a problem in this audience, but if it does, uh, you don't have the stomach for it or feel you shouldn't look, uh, don't have the right to look, you can, of course, leave when it's off. Uh, no penalties will apply. Uh, I hope you'll stay uh, uh, because your responses, whatever they may be, are entirely relevant uh, and valuable to my project, which is about the power and uses and meanings of the photographic anatomical image and about the difference that photography makes uh, and about the changing practice and ethics of anatomical display and voyeurism and prurience as people debated those things long ago, maybe as they debate them now as well. So uh, let's begin with a passage uh, from an article published in an 1860 issue of a medical journal. It begins, quote, there is no art that has made such profound strides in this, the most progressive of all centuries, as that of photography. The most profound philosophers of this age have studied and elaborated it as a science, while thousands are daily practicing it as an art. No single branch of art of its age is so universal, no science of modern times has more engaged the attention of philosophic investigators. No science or art, not strictly medical, will more richly repay the scientific physician. So argued Ransfordy van Giesen, an ambitious 24-year-old surgeon of Brooklyn, New York, extolling photography, this truly beautiful science, and this the most progressive of all centuries. Van Giesen repeatedly invokes the word science and so makes a pact with his medical readers, we physicians, are scientific moderns. Medicine, science, and the field of photography are progressing in a very particular time, modern times. Van Giesen devotes most of his text to the particulars of photographic microbiology, but before he gets technical, he offers a list of other potential medical applications. To the anatomist, photography can secure accurate representations of anatomical specimens which for faithful delineation far surpass the most trustworthy engravings. The pathologist can fix upon paper the most rare and curious specimens of disease. The surgeon will be enabled to present the exact appearance of the deformity in any given fracture, dislocation, or any external surgical lesion whatsoever. Van Giesen's unbridled enthusiasm for photography, his faith in its power to secure accurate representations of objects, persons, and scenes, and its special role as a vector of modernity, uh, and his strongly held commitment to a historicist belief in progress are typical of mid-19th centuries on photography and medicine and every other profession. I'm just wondering here for a second. Let me pause and go back to my very beginning. Um, I just want to make sure I have the right version of this talk for you, and I'm not sure that I do. Um, so I'm going to just do something, and we can hum a tune or something, but uh, maybe this is not the, I seem to be able to see this on my screen. 
Okay, I'm gonna take it back here. Just don't. Yeah, okay, I am correct. Sorry about that. I've written so many different versions of this talk, mainly for grants that I'm applying for. <laughs> Words sound a little unfamiliar to me. Okay, yes, no. Back to our regularly scheduled presentation. Uh, okay, where was I? Uh, we have, of course, been sensitized to the multiple ways in which photography is not a simple transcription of reality. The ways in which a picture and its subjects can be posed, lit, cleaned up, framed, altered to suppress or emphasize detail. The photographic view is a contrivance and not the real. But for Van Giesen and many others, photography had enormous epistemological authority, promised to show a disinterested, objective, and abundantly detailed view. Quote, it is an absolutely unprejudiced observer. Another quote, the sensitive plate records with absolute fidelity the image thrown upon it. Um, gives the impression of an infinite amount of detail. Uh, so we can take Van Giesen's article as a representative text for what a few decades later, a less enthusiastic writer of the 1890s called the craze for medical photography, which is to say that there was a kind of intoxicated pleasure in medical photography, pleasure in photographic apparatus and technique, in tinkering and experimenting, and pleasure in the showing and viewing of bodies, body parts, and objects. This was especially true in the field of gross anatomy. The photographical anatomist positioned himself as an objective observer and a showman. The joy of photography, its modernness and nerdy technological complexity, fused with the abundant pleasures of anatomical exhibition and pleasure in, that, in the display of that centuries-old anatomical specialty the normative body turned inside out to display freaky monstrosity. Photography enabled anatomists to perform themselves as modern and scientific, but the process and results were very peculiar, at odds with disinterested objectivity. When Nicolaus Rudinger, Eugène Louis Doyen, George McClellan, and other anatomists took to photography, they took liberties. They manipulated their photographs in theatrical and painterly ways demonstratively cutting, slicing, posing, and lighting their cadavers and body parts to suit the camera. The photographic images were silhouetted, drawn on, colored, superimposed over other photos, cropped, diagrammed, and outfitted with a halo of captions. The artist's pen and brush were as evident as the anatomist saw and scalpel, and all were subject uh, to an aesthetic. The photographic image put on a show on the printed page or on the walls of the exhibition hall or lecture hall screen, or in the visual field of the stereoscopic viewer. That show, in turn, referred back to performances in the dissecting room, surgical theater, uh, classroom, and anatomical museum, medical spaces, but also the theatrical stage, the art gallery, the carnival tent, and the magazine advertisement. The anatomical photograph got the attention of the profession but at the risk of offending colleagues who might see it as grandstanding. Science, the critics argued, should be conducted with a certain sobriety. Too much pleasure in the show subverted the ethos of disinterested scientific investigation. One could be adjudged vulgar, stained by association with the displays of fairground anatomy and the peep show. Tasteful restraint, scopic modesty was increasingly regarded as a constituent part of the performance of scientific modernity in medicine, as opposed to the theatrical extravagances of Baroque anatomy. Think of Vesalius, of course, and uh, Valverde, and many others. Reviewing the accomplishments and prospects of photographic anatomy in its first 30 years of existence, Wilhelm Hiss, the eminent Swiss anatomist, remarked that, quote, images which are half photographed, half painting, make a pretty uncomfortable impression. Drawings copied from the photograph and rendered in an appropriate manner would be as credible, but more beautiful. And that dismissive reception is surely one reason why the field of anatomy 
was mostly reluctant to embrace photography. There were, of course, other reasons, uh, technical difficulties, problems with lighting, depth of field, printing on paper, uh, problems of printing the photograph with text and caption, conveying te texture and color, and consistency of product. Okay. Now, over the decades, many of these technical difficulties were overcome. Yet the photograph still did not become the dominant mode of anatomical illustration. This was perhaps because anatomy, more than any other medical discipline, was heavily invested in artist-made illustration. The long and glorious tradition of anatomist-artist collaboration was central to the Vesalian refounding of the discipline in the 16th century. Uh, there was at the same time a tradition of physician-made, surgeon-made illustration, uh, and here, that kind of illustration was valued as a heuristic device, a uh, form of study, a way to learn and cognitively recognize the structures of the human body. And also, there was pleasure in the drawing. Uh, drawing was a pleasurable medical pastime. Uh, drawing by hand with pen and pencil was seen as an analog and complement to dissection by hand with knife and scalpel. Used the same kind of coordination, the same, uh, the same kind of cognitive frame. Uh, at least, or the, there was an attempt to collapse those cognitive frames. And the sumptuously illustrated, beautifully printed anatomical atlas was taken to be the highest form of medical publication. It was the most expensive and collectible form of medical publication. Beyond that, uh, within the discipline of medicine, uh, the aesthetic investment in anatomical illustration connected medicine not just to science, but to Greco-Roman civilization and the post-Renaissance tradition of figurative naturalism. Anatomy was a foundational subject in both the medical curriculum and the art curriculum. And a professor of anatomy in the art academy was nearly always a professor in the medical school as well. So take as an example uh, this 1856 plate by anatomist artist Joseph McLeese, which deploys uh, aestheticized figure studies with sensual and erotic valences uh, in an atlas marketed to practicing surgeons and their students. And it was a standard work uh, for several generations regarded as a triumph of both uh, artistic and surgical uh, achievement. Quite beautiful work. Photography in its initial, uh, uh, in its debut, seemed to sidestep or actively counter the aestheticized scientific image. And the use of photography and anatomy quickly gained adherence after Nicholas Rudinger commenced his pioneering photographic publication of the anatomy of the peripheral nerves in 1861. That's the figure on the left. I don't know, it's a little washed out. Maybe there's a, a little bit too much light in the room. Uh, can you see it? Uh, you know, some of the detail is missing. Anyway. Um, ambitious anatomists in many countries experimented with photography uh, and made many thousands of photographs. Uh, that work was always entangled with other modernizing research agendas and technologies, uh, topographical and regional anatomy, composite photography, stereoscopy, uh, x-radiography, medical museology, uh, racial anatomy, health education campaigns, and medical motion pictures. And from the very start, uh, anatomical photography was entangled with the movement to modernize hand-drawn anatomical illustration. Lithographs uh, and engravings were increasingly based on reference photographs. Swedish anatomist Gustav Bretzius uh, uh, used photographs as reference as far back as the 1850s. Atlases of hand-drawn artwork were offered as a more legible surrogate of the photograph, which was in turn offered as a surrogate of reality. So it was kind of a chain of surrogates. And beyond that, many anatomical illustrations aspired to make works of photograph-influenced naturalism. There was then a dynamic relation between photography and anatomical illustration. The illustration aspired to be as accurate as a photograph, even to look photographic. The photograph aspired to be as legible as an artist-drawn illustration, and even in some cases, have some of the aesthetic qualities of an artist-drawn illustration, or not. The figure on right is from an 1870 a uh, volume of artist-drawn anatomical illustrations which used photographic images as a reference and epistemological guarantor. But the photographic original 
is maybe you can't see it, is not a pure photograph, far from it. Uh, the plate's been heavily retouched to make the image clearer and cleaner to bring out certain aspects of the anatomy of the head. And oddly, the photographic original is in some ways more legible than the steel engraved drawing that copies it. I'm wondering, is there any way that we can turn off a little bit of the light in here, or is it just on and off? Do you know? Don't want to turn, put you completely in the dark. Maybe that's a little bit. Oh. Is that okay? I don't want to. If you, that also, if you want to snooze now, you'll be uh, a little bit less. Uh, anyway, so as the aesthetics are complicated. Uh, are these images from uh, Eugène Louis Doyen's early 20th century photographic atlas beautiful or ugly or both? That we can pose such an odd aesthetic question is an indication that photographic anatomy is richly complex and even though mostly seen as marginal, connected to big issues. The issue of epistemic authority in scientific publication and practice, there's questions of objectivity, knowledge production and the truth and how those are performed and validated and sustained in representation and in reading and viewing. And these are questions which go to the origins of the development of science as a category in discourse and as idiosyncratically practiced in various disciplines uh, and in publication and text and image and diagram. Uh, how did photography function as a rhetoric and technology of uh, mechanical objectivity? Of course, I'm gesturing here to uh, Daston and Gallison. How did the anatomical photograph fix or disrupt the medical gaze in the subject that it constitutes? Gesturing here to Michel Foucault. There is the issue of aesthetics in the scientific image, the relationship between art and science and artist and scientist, the relationship between the beautiful and the true, beauty and ugliness as structurally imposed uh, signifiers of the real, and the problem of the tacit and articulated conventions and genres of the picture and pictorialism in art and science, and in the larger build belt and the, the picture environment uh, in which all of these images were created. Uh, issues that are at the heart of work uh, done by art historians like Rosalind Krauss and then image media scholars like Horst Bredekamp and Alfred Tauber and Martin Kemp. A long succession of art historians have dealt with this, stretching back to Panofsky and Warburg. Uh, and then there's the issue of the visual rhetoric and performance of the modern, where modernity is a moving target and a capacious signifier and science and scientificity are moving targets within the moving target, uh, which is the subject of, of my new book, Body Modern, and also a recent work by Andreas Killen and Cornelius Borg, Matthew Biro, Janet Ward. With that said, uh, let's consider this soiled figure from Nicholas Radebe's Rudinger's uh, Atlas of the Peripheral Nervous System, uh, the very first uh, photographic anatomical study published in Munich in 1861 when Rudinger was only 29 years old. I can't find any photographs of him from that age, so this is uh, older Rudinger looking back on his youthful work. Uh, the photographs were printed on paper separately from the text, pasted onto pages that are 26 centimeters tall. Uh, a pretty ambitious, and the largeness of that indicates the ambition of it. Observe that while it's uh, evidently photographic and advertises such. It's heavily retouched, a hybrid of drawing and painting and photography. The hand of the artist compensates for the technical limitations of the photograph, which were many. In 1861, artificial light sources weren't strong enough to light the photographic subject, so unfocused daylight had to be used. It was hard to make images legible. Dark areas of the body often turned to black, hard to print photographic images in large quantities and near impossible to print them on the same page as text. Uh, that photography in medicine was new and exciting and performed the modern, created cultural capital, a buzz that attracted the patronage of the Bavarian court of King Maximilian II and then of his son Ludwig II, uh, and the participation of court photographer Josef Albert, a, a bohemian savant who photographed the Bavarian royal family and friends and also photographed many scenes from Wagnerian opera. Rudinger's collaboration with Albert was published under the aegis of the Literary Artistic Institute, uh, Literarische Artistische Anstalt, 
which tells us that cultural, scientific, and medical accomplishments were perceived to be allied and not opposing categories. The publisher, Kata Shen, was one of the great presses of German romanticism and uh, published a, a, full, a list full of science and literature and philosophy works by Goethe and Schiller and uh, Schelling and Hans Christian Oersted. Uh, there's an improvisational feel to Rudinger and Albert's atlas. They're trying to figure things out. Some plates are so heavily gone over that the underlying photograph is almost entirely covered up by pen and brush. The image loses its photographicity. In this plate, uh, the most photographic parts of the image are in the borderlands of the bony ripples in the back of the cranium, the five o'clock shadow, under the nose. I don't think you can see it too well, but uh, it is really a work of pen and ink. Uh, in the final volume of Rudinger's Folio, published in 1867, six years after the first, plates take on a different look. Some of the figures are photographed against dark backgrounds to provide more contrast. Some appear to be raw, unaltered by an artist's hand. And one other thing is apparent. The images are exceedingly ugly, which makes them different from contemporary hand-drawn anatomical illustrations. The rhetorically emphatic ugliness asserts the truthfulness of the image, asserts Rudinger's modernness and commitment to scientific objectivity, uh, which is a rejection of the romanticism of Natur Philosophie, the dominant movement of the previous generation of Central European anatomy. Uh, a rejection of Natur philosophy's insistence that in nature, the beautiful and the true must always converge. A program which admittedly expands and revises what counts for beauty. But here I don't think these count for beauty. In other words, anatomical photography is a story of generational conflict and succession. Uh, also, a how to get modern story, a how to get scientific story, and a how to get ahead story. And the context for this is that in the middle and late decades of the 1800s, gross anatomy was at a crossroads, while for centuries, anatomy was the most visible part of the program to make medicine scientific. By the 1860s, it had a lot of competition in pathology, microbiology, embryology, neurology, uh, and other fields were the exciting fields. Uh, where medical students once clamored to dissect they now clamor to work with microscopes and advanced instruments and new technologies in the laboratory and the clinic. There are, of course, other ways to be modern and scientific going on at the same time. Photographic anatomy was preceded by and in the 1870s became entangled with a movement with similar aims and aspirations, cross-sectional topographical anatomy. Topographical anatomy, a new field based on new techniques, allowed anatomists to renew their claim to being modern and scientific by making a critique of classical anatomy and its methods. In classical anatomy, the anatomist dissects out parts and systems using a scalpel and other instruments. Much of the material is thrown away, but some of it is used to make preparations of specimens for collection and display. Illustrations of the dissected body or specimen are usually rendered in some kind of illusionistic perspective. In cross-sectional topographic anatomy, the anatomist deep freezes a corpse, so this is not a good method to use in Spain, uh, and uses a saw to turn it into a series of flat surfaces. Uh, such surfaces are traced onto paper or glass, and the tracing is given over to artists and printers for refinement, labeling, coloring. The slices and derivative tracings and illustrations can then be arranged into a series, and so participate in the serial method that was then a staple of comparative anatomy, embryology, and the physical sciences. The cross-section was particularly suited to book publication. The body was sliced in a series of planes, each one corresponding to a printed page. The claim was that topographical illustration showed the relation of the parts in situ and was more accurate and precise than freehand artist-rendered illustration. In the 1860s, uh, Leipzig anatomist Wilhelm Brauner was the most important exponent of topographic anatomy. His large format atlas of 1867-72 was celebrated as a scientific and aesthetic achievement. Brown's illustrations glowed with color and a radiant aura of captions. It was a spectacularly precise and beautiful production, which for many decades set the standard 
for illustrated topographical anatomy. Now, this is important because after Brown, most anatomical photography was topographical, in part because topographical anatomy had a buzz, in part because it was easier to light, photograph, and legibly print a two-dimensional slice than a three-dimensional dissection. In any case, with photography, the subject had to be chosen carefully, and the brain, a fashionable subject of anatomical research, was an obvious choice. Brain slice patterns were very legible on a, a photographic plate, the slices were small enough to be lit evenly and were easy to pose before the camera. One could then supply an accompanying diagram based on a trace of the photograph. The, di the diagram was in some ways the study, the result. The photograph was the evidence, the epistemological guarantor, and a rhetorically powerful object. Uh, this is the earliest photographic study of the brain, Jules Bernard's Louise, 1873, photographic iconography of the central nervous system. The photographs are pasted in, in the early 1870s, there was no good way to print a photograph on a page along with text. But change was soon forthcoming. In 1873, Josef Albert invented something called Albertotype, a variation on the colotype printing process, and a year later devised a three-color photomechanical printing process. And as the technology improved, the ambitious anatomist could photograph a greater variety of subjects, the hand, the infant, the face, the ear, and the published product could take on a more finished, polished look, uh, take on some of the qualities of an artist-made illustration. So as we've seen, uh, Rudinger's first effort, uh, his large uh, black and white folio of the peripheral nerves, used traditional methods of classical anatomy dissection and was only available in a large format unbound folio edition. And as we've seen, and as we have seen, uh, the images were grayish, uneven, and unlovely. Inspired by Brown, Rudinger's topographical surgical atlas of uh, the 1870s uh, featured brightly colored photographic frozen cross-sections of faces and babies. Uh, the images do not need to work in tandem with the diagram. They are the, di the diagram, do all of the work of the anatomical illustration. The colotype process involved directly printing photographic material from lithographic stones. Like his early experiments, Rudinger's color plates go way beyond retouching. They're hybrids, photographic paintings, uh, painted photographs. Art historian Martin Kemp compares them unfavorably to Brown. But this scans Rudinger's highly original achievement. Brown was the top dog of topographical anatomy, a pillar of the German medical establishment, Students came from all over the world to study with him. Rudinger didn't have Brown as resources. He was born the 12th son of a farmer and butcher who died, his father died when he was three. Unable to afford medical school, he was instead a, apprenticed to a barber. Uh, the German speaking lands in the 1850s were in some ways the most advanced in Europe, but in other ways, the most traditional. In Heidelberg, members of the Guild of Barbers were permitted to take one course in anatomy Rudinger took advantage of that to get a barber's degree in what was then called minor surgery. In other words, in the year 1850, at the age of 18, he became a barber surgeon, uh, an occupational category that had become extinct in both Britain and France 100 years earlier. <coughs> a few years later, after receiving a small inheritance, he was able to take a full course of medical instruction and eventually received a full medical degree in 1855. He excelled at Heidelberg, showed great talent, but even with the patronage of major figures like uh, Theodor von uh, Bischoff and Justus von Liebig and friends in the court of Ludwig II of Bavaria, he still couldn't get a regular appointment to the medical faculty. Uh, the social prejudice against barbers and people of his social class weighed heavily against him. So 15 years after his first photographic anatomical study and numerous publications, he was still only a prosector and an adjunct. Given the situation, he was perhaps driven to extremes to dramatize his expertise, his commitment to science, and a more modernized, more scientific anatomy. He couldn't match Brown's magnificence. Uh, uh, his top, Rudinger's topographical anatomy was a smaller format book printed on lower quality paper without the assistance of a brilliant artist, and so he used colorized photography only three colors, starkly silhouetted against a black background, uh, 
in this period, it was still usual practice was to show figures against the white of the page. Uh, the publication placed him in the company of Brown as a topographical anatomist and innovator, and it, in 1880, at age 48, helped him to finally receive a full appointment to the medical faculty. But his publications never circulated globally, unlike Brown, who was translated into English and French. Uh, and the eminent Swiss anatomist Wilhelm Hiss, who in contrast became full professor of anatomy at age 26, uh, and he was not generous to Rudinger. In his 1891 review of the history of photographic anatomy, uh, the Swiss anatomist dismissed images, such as the topographical anatomy of Rudinger, which are half photograph, half painting. Now, to my eyes, uh, Rudinger's plates are beautiful, even though Hiss said that they were quite unbeautiful. But notice, uh, the photographic, least painted parts of the image are the undissected ones, the undissected parts, the borderlands of the image. The dissected parts are colored and painted to look more like an artist-drawn chromolithograph. Uh, Hiss does not comment on that convergence, nor does he acknowledge that some highly naturalistic artist-made anatomical illustrations with grotesque views of dissections could also induce discomfort. But Hiss, of course, assumes that the viewers under discussion uh, are medical men entitled by training and status to see the difficult anatomical object and trained to rise above the discomfort or even relish it because the difficult image was a strange kind of luxury good, an exotic or even collectible visual experience, a part of uh, medical culture and connoisseurship. In many ways, uh, the anatomical photograph Rudinger and, and the people who followed him uh, was rhetorically an anti-aesthetic object. It made higher epistemological claims that aspire to outrank the hand-drawn medical illustration, rejects the artist in favor of the recording, the transcription device, what Bastin and Gaussian call mechanical objectivity. But unaided, photography could not make a fully competent anatomical image. And in any case, it was impossible to make a printed image that could stand entirely outside the system of aesthetics, outside the cultural political regimes that structure representation and sensual experience. <coughs> the photographic anatomist couldn't refrain from making aesthetic choices, couldn't refrain from clarifying and beautifying the anatomical view, even if he stands against the conventions of anatomical representation, and even if he treats the photograph as a provocation, uh, maybe a protest or maybe just attempt to outbid the competition. Uh, George McClellan was the author of an 1892 photographical atlas of regional anatomy and also author of a book entitled Anatomy and Its Relation to Art. He was professor of anatomy at the strictly medical Thomas Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia and also the Philadelphia Academy of Fine Art where he associated with the painter Thomas Aikens and other Philadelphia artists. McClellan had an artist's sensibility. He performed the dissections for his photographic study of regional anatomy, took the photographs himself, and colored and painted over them himself with watercolor. He took full advantage of improvements in the technology of photography and print reproduction uh, that were greatly advancing in the 1890s. McClellan almost phobist sensibility. Uh, now, I began by arguing that there was crazy pleasure in all of this. Uh, and which is evident in the work of Rudinger and McClellan, but which Eugène Louis Doyen takes to extremes in his topographical anatomy of 1911-1912. Historians have mainly written about Doyen as the first great medical filmmaker. Between 1898 and 1906, he produced and starred in more than 60 motion pictures, including a notorious film of a surgery to separate conjoined twins. He also invented New surgical devices, techniques, and treatments, including a widely publicized electrical therapy for tuberculosis and an antibiotic tonic to treat cancer. A prodigious surgeon who performed difficulties, difficult surgeries with precision, speed, and theatrical flourish, Dwyan was perhaps the last great exponent of the great French tradition of extravagant surgical showmanship. He was also a notorious provocateur who denounced and insulted the Parisian medical establishment at every turn for being mediocre and failing to be modern. 
supporters uh, describe him as brilliant, detractors as charlatan, uh, truth probably somewhere in between. Uh, Dwyan's photography cuts right to a contradiction at the heart of traditional anatomical image production. The image in Vesalius and other canonical anatomical texts constructs a universal human subject. And its claim to show the human body, its demonstrations of what humanity consists of, and in conveying those claims via the use of bodies modeled upon classical ideals and current norms of the masculine and feminine. Those texts, of course, often also show the particularity of specimens and the monstrosity of dissected bodies. So there's a doubleness, a human, non-human, binary, uh, self and other binary. Dwyan also anatomizes to generalize. His subject is the anatomy of the human body. But harsh photographic specificity of the human bodies that he anatomized uh, undermines any normative ideals, runs counter to the conventions of anatomical universalism. Issued in seven installments, uh, Dwyan's atlas of 279 heliotype photographic plates of cross-section bodies imposes a grid upon his anatomical subjects instead of following the natural systems and lines of the body. Like no other anatomist before him, Dwyan systematically pressed upon photography as a visual rhetoric of the real. Uh, against the grain of anatomical practice, he selected his subjects with no regard for the beauty of their bodies and showed them in their entirety. The subjects show the marks of their origins at the low end of the social spectrum, stand before the viewer as people who led hard lives and whose bodies ended up unclaimed in the morgue, hospital, or prison. Not quite anatomy verite, but a harsh kind of anatomical truth-telling, which to be sure has antecedents in the 17th and 18th century anatomies of Bidlew, Haller, uh, William Hunter, and John Bell. It's as if Dwyan was riding the same wave as Emil Zola and Henrik Ibsen, uh, applying the call for naturalism to anatomical imagery instead of literature and theater. Even so, like the work of Zola and Ibsen, uh, Dwyan's anatomy was highly contrived. He dramatically silhouetted and posed his subjects in ways that were designed to emotionally affect the viewer, to amaze and maybe repulse. His atlas was a theater of anatomical cruelty, an eccentrically staged, arresting tableau of human parts and wholes. The aesthetic, really a ramped up anti-aesthetic, was yoked to a strong scientific program uh, Dwyan wanted to create a comprehensive indexed atlas of the human body as a series of standardized slices. Seriality, again, the arrangement of objects into series uh, was increasingly important in late 19th, early 20th century science. Uh, and the rationale was that the objects of study could be compared, and from these comparisons, the scientists could derive generalizable laws or principles. While that was axiomatic and comparative ad anatomy or racial anatomy or evolutionary biology, embryology. Uh, no one had ever done it so rigorously or systematically in gross anatomy, although the question is, is there the same kind of payoff? I mean, it's, it is a principle of, of seriality ruthlessly supplied, but you can't make generalizable principles, I don't think, from that, and he didn't attempt to. And no one had ever done this photographically, although Brown had started and Rogoff had started this project. Uh, Dwyan, if it's not uh, apparent already, was an egomaniac in love with photography, in love with himself, and he loved to appear in photographs. So in this sequence of photographs, he appears along with his assistants as they prepare specimens, which here look like uh, slices of steak, uh, uh, thick slices of steak. So we have an archive not just of anatomical objects, but anatomical object creation. Uh, Dwyane's goal was to slice the body into a series of layers of equal thickness, like the leaves of a book of meat. The cadavers were prepared with a series of formalin injections to harden the organs while maintaining their shape and, and color. Unlike the topographical anatomy of Brown and Riedinger, uh, no freezing was required. After the injections, the specimens were left to cure and harden uh, for two to six months to undergo what Dwyane called a veritable scientific mummification, the length of time depending on levels of fat in the body and size of preparation. After this was done, the bodies were placed on a trolley, mounted on rails, and fed through what he called a megatome, a five meter long band saw running on a six horsepower engine. So 
modern, modern, modern in every aspect of this uh, use of uh, modern photographic technology, modern uh, engineering, modern machine making. Here's a very difficult and, uh, and odd photograph of the bandsaw in action, working on a very odd and difficult object to produce. The cadaver's arms and legs have been sawed off in previous runs through the megatome. Now the torso will be bisected. Oddly, the penis has been mummified and injected to a state of erection and is to be bisect bisected in the first or second uh, cut through the body. Uh, the slices uh, mounted and sequentially arranged for photography were retained afterwards for display in lectures and in Dwyan's museum in the cathedral town of Reims. Uh, the museum was destroyed during the Second World War, unfortunately. So, so these photographs were saved and some, some objects were saved, but mostly gone. Uh, I've mentioned that lighting was always a challenge for anatomical photography. Dwyan used the latest lighting technology, a massive arc floodlight apparatus to flood his specimens with light. And there he's showing off his stuff. The resultant photographic plates were heavily retouched and silhouetted. In some pictures in, in the series, the face is fully visible. Here, wearing what appears to be stage makeup, a cross-section face looks up imploringly in horror. Even more shocking is the way Dwayne provocatively takes the face apart, slice by slice in every dimension, and puts it back together. Dwayne typically poses and silhouettes his subjects so they appear to stand free, almost defiantly alive in the negative space of the page. Anatomical atlases are often theatrical, but none is more glaringly transgressive. Dwayne goes beyond naturalism and its sensationalism uh, in its desire, in his desire to shock, as shock intensified by the specificity of the anatomical subject, whose face and body are utterly exposed and disfigured. His initial attempt to present his anatomical slices to the public caused a riot. On 19 April 1910, an audience of over 2,000 assembled in the Grand Amphitheater of the Parisian Faculty of Medicine to see the first lecture of his course in topographic anatomy, illustrated by projected hand-colored slides as well as preserved specimens. Dwayne had just openly denounced the professors of the faculty as incompetent careerists, and the audience was stocked with, determines, uh, with, with students determined to defend the honor of their professors and also paid disruptors, Parisian street thugs, called then Apaches in the, in the popular press. Soon after the Lecture commenced, a chorus of boos and whistles broke out. Oops. Uh, paper planes thrown from the audience gave way to stones. Fist fights erupted. Riot attracted international attention, even an article in the New York Times. Dwyan was forced from the stage, and the Faculty of Medicine canceled uh, his course of topographical anatomy. But Dwyan nimbly moved on to other venues where he continued to give lectures featuring projections uh, of slides and films and dissections performed on the spot for audiences of up to 1,000. Uh, these printed plates give us some idea of how the colored slide projections looked. Dwyan was independently wealthy. He had resources to shoot photographs and to make movies, and he had wealth enough to finance the publication of his very own medical journal, uh, Archive de Doyen, which for a run of three years from 1910 through 1912 served as a venue for his photographic projects, was fully stocked with dramatic and bizarre images of surgical procedures and anatomical sections, all performed by the Grand Doyen himself. His great resources even allowed him to experiment with color photography, which was expensive and difficult in the 1910s. Even now, these photographs pop with colorful bloody brilliance. The publications were all aimed at a medical audience, but Dwyan played everything out in public. He was a great figure, a celebrity, a swordsman, a passionate advocate of socialism, a Dreyfusard, a pioneering medical filmmaker, inventor, and so forth. His family fortune came from a company that manufactured a popular brand of champagne, a champagne, Grand Vin 
the Champagne and Doyen uh, and company. Hence the paper money that seems to be growing out of the surgical apron in the caricature sculpture on the left, which is a parody of uh, Valverde's famous 16th century anatomical illustration, and the skeleton celebrating with a pop bottle of bubbly uh, in the caricature engraving on the right. It said that Louis Pasteur invited him to collaborate and join Institut Pasteur. Doyen declined. Uh, Le Grand Doyen didn't need Louis Pasteur. The faculty of John Hopkin, Johns Hopkins, the, who were the great innovators of American medicine and surgery and medical education, doing a tour of Europe, watched Doyen perform a surgical operation. They were reportedly appalled by his grandstanding flourishes and the way he kind of, voila, as he gestured. Popular press, as you can see, took notice, and in the golden age of a Grand Guignol theater, uh, made the obvious association, Doyen was a ghoul, the very figure of the bloodthirsty surgeon who so regularly appeared on the Grand Guignol stage. Does everyone here know what Grand Guignol was, is? Maybe not. Uh, anyway, it was a very bloody, sensationalist, popular theatrical form that flourished around this time. Lots of stage blood and sadism. Here you can see uh, uh, the artist, um, did, I, did I miss one? Oh, they're out of order. Doyen was a friend of Dr. Achille Adrien Proust, Marcel Proust's father, and was a frequent visitor to the Proust home and it said that in A la Recherche uh, Les Temps Perdus, uh, the character of Dr. Cotard, an insecure, pompous social climber, given to sneering jealousy and feeble witticisms is based in part on Doyen. Uh, this satirical li lithograph by Adrien Darer depicts unsmiling members of the Faculty of Medicine of Paris attending a lecture demonstration by Doyen who gestures in front of a smiling, naked female anatomical <coughs> subject surrounded by cameras, gramophones, and champagne bottles. Uh, and I don't know what the gramophones are. The, in a bunch of these cartoons, the gramophone appears, so I don't know whether it's that, uh, I, I really have, just at the start of my research on Dwayne, I don't know whether it's that he did surgery with musical accompaniment or he recorded himself. Uh, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm sure there's some meaning to that. Uh, the artist Barrère, who did that lithograph that we just saw, also designed a large number of posters for Parisian cinemas and Grand Guignol Theater. Uh, and Georges Bula, another artist who did this uh, lithographic caricature on the, the, where you can see the figure of death uh, uh, is even shocked. Even the figure of death is shocked by Dwayne performing surgery on his veritable scientifically mummified patient. Anyway, uh, in this series, Dwayne places the anatomical subject on a table, performs an anatomical guillotine in multiple slices. Quite remarkable. Actually, I, when I first presented this, I animated this, and then I said, oh, this is, this is too gimmicky, but uh, they're all pretty much in register. You can see the head fall off. Uh, Dwyane's an anatomy was emphatically playful. One can easily imagine his perverse satisfaction in the difficulty of the thing he was doing. I have to admit, I actually also feel some pleasure in the, seeing these peculiar multivalent photographs and, and, uh, and this particular series and the series that it initiates. There's, there is no joking, no winking in the accompanying text. It's all serious. Captions indexed to reassemble uh, body, provide a dry table of contents for the accompanying sequence of slices. All scientific, no joking. Sociologist philosopher Bruno Latour famously argues that there's nothing you can dominate as easily as a flat surface. The tour is mostly referring to the inscription and transfer of three-dimensional views onto two-dimensional rectangular pieces of paper. But here, an odd intermediary step disrupts the process. Before it goes to paper, the human body is chopped up to make overlaid, flat, stackable surfaces. These surfaces then are imprinted on paper, collected together in books uh, to serve as serial representations of a three-dimensional body. Dwyane represents the flatness with great rigor, but plays with slices, puts them back together again, takes them apart. Latour argues that power comes from the up and down scaling of images and the transformation of them into optically consistent planes. 
which is what Dwayan does when he divides bodies and photographs and, and prints images and slices, scales them up and down, takes them apart, puts them together, uh, makes the body into a series of flat pages. But his atlas emphasis in almost a sculptural way the three-dimensionality of the body, its neediness, its volume, and its helplessness before the anatomist. It's completely different from Brown, who it's just a series of flat surfaces in Brown. Uh, there's a peculiar oscillation between the two-dimensional textualized flatness and three-dimensional embodiedness. Uh, if scientific knowledge is about the making of two-dimensional models, the reduction of three-dimensional embodiment to the flat surface of a page, uh, with this, when you make something a, a, a three-dimensional, two-dimensional, uh, you can also comment on the inevitable distortions of such models and methods used. Dwyan's atlas seems to perform a check on that, uh, mediates between the embodied real and the two-dimensionality of the printed image. Uh, as hi art historian uh, David Friedberg long ago argued, images have the power to affect us deeply. Representations of the anatomical body have a particularly, peculiarly recursive power of the image. That recursivity means the anatomical representation is a kind of portmanteau identity object that we put on the shelf or carry around in our heads as the need or desire arises, or just as a habitual underlying self-representation, a cognitive layer, which is stored in books and articles of text and images. The, that anatomical image uh, inevitably affirms a cognitive order, a gender order, a social order, political economic regime, bo uh, body discipline. But strangely, uh, the anatomical image always exceeds those disciplinary projects, or at least has the potential to do that. Uh, now, Dwyan in this was an extremophile. He used his photographs to live at the margins, and his work nurtured and contributed to a larger culture of semantic extremism, the same culture that was notoriously on display in Grand Guignol Theater and the illustrated mass circulation press and the sensationalist novel and the erotic caricature. That extremism had a masculine, masculinist valence, was a performance of hyper-aggressive, provocative, monstrous manliness, a show of heedless masculine risk-taking against the timidity, dullness, caution of his peers. So it's a crazy kind of performance art, uh, avant le metteur, a shocker, uh, and the dramatizing imperative runs up against scientific skepticism. Theatricality is the trademark of the charlatan. Uh, but Dwyane does this gleefully, deliberately, provocatively. He's both a man of science and a man of modernity and a disruptor, an anarchist, a prankster. Uh, in one direction, that leads us back into the domain of aesthetics, the artfulness of the anatomical image uh, the emplacement of the image within the privileged tradition of European figurative art uh, legitimizes professional pleasure. We don't just take pleasure in the view, we admire the art with a capital A. But how then should we characterize the aesthetic principles which are at work in the provocatively anti-aesthetic photographic image? Or in other works, and I use this one as an example, which are entirely indifferent to European art tradition, which make no reference even in opposition. because. Even if a work doesn't aspire to beauty, and this one is a very practical and sober instructional autopsy handbook, there's always in representation some aesthetic order of things, an aspiration to perform clarity, evaluation of boundaries between pictorial regions and our perspective. It, it shows, it actually uses a saw originally, if you, it's just a hand saw, but then uh, later on a, a mechanical saw to turn the body into a, a series of slices, which is, sort of like turning the body into a diagram. So there's this, there's these two kinds of forms of, of representation. There's the diagrammatic uh, thing in, in topographical anatomy in Brown and other ones, they saw the body in a frame, they put a piece of paper or a piece of glass over it, trace it as precisely as possible. Then it's gonna be printed or maybe just sliced or going to a museum. Uh, and those are, these are very aesthetic objects, although they, every time you sort of bring an anti-aesthetic in, it becomes aestheticized in its own way. So the Browns are particularly beautiful, uh, uh, print production, and even the aesthetic is not just in 
the representation on pages. How well you actually make the slide, how neat it is, and how beautiful it is, and precise it is. It's, it takes a, a lot of art. And there's, so there's art in the, in, I think there's an art in dissecting and comparing specimens to the museum. There's an art in these slices, which uh, start out as being a kind of a challenge. happens in these, as I think happens in, in 18th century anatomy, is you, they par in part they change the definition of what it counts to be beautiful. So, uh, so my project in this one and, and the pre-anatomy thing has really sort of become a bit about the semantic, the meaning of ugliness uh, 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 is my provocation. There's a certain theater in it. Um, when people start theorizing uh, the aesthetic in the 18th century, England, some of them concentrate on beauty, but there's also the sublime, and there's also novelty. And, and uh, those three categories are, are mobilized as something that men of taste, and it's, you know, this, just like there's a knowledge, it's what Kuhn talks about, a knowledge community in science. Well, there are these knowledge communities in the arts, and they're not saying, sometimes they want to say, is this true, but also they want to say, is this beautiful, is this artful? And so you get something like in William Hunter, a very, very ugly anatomical subject of pregnant women who have only diving pregnants who, whose legs are sawed off so they look like something you'd see in a butcher shop, done with amazing artistry, brilliant artistry, so that even if the subject is ugly, the contours and surfaces of it have great beauty and, and the craftsmanship artistry of the artist is uh, very rhetorically powerful. So in this photography stuff, the odd thing is it's the visual rhetoric of the real, but it's not very good. I mean, uh, it has its high epistemological status, but we can't light it, we can't show it, we can't paint it, and then, but people persist at it. It never dominates. It's never the dominant form of anatomical representation. Bellu in the 19 30s uh, is comes as close to it as possible, but he's a Uruguayan Argentine. He's how I don't I, I all of these. This is a massive research project. I should have to really do it right. One would need a team of people uh, to go to to Argentina. Like how far did Belu's publication circulate in the Spanish speaking world? I have no idea. I don't know in what editions they had. How far I know that he was well-regarded that he came to Washington, D.C. The National Library of Medicine collected his work, thought he was an important enough author, to, uh, and uh, he addressed international conferences. And, but I don't know. So uh, in, any, in any case, there's a, it's a moving target all along, and that's one of the problems with beauty, just like it is with this other thing that's going on, which is to be modern, how to be modern, uh, which is to say, be modern could be a challenge to the power structure. It could be something that young and ambitious, marginal people on the periphery, or people like Rudinger, who's a poor, a poor boy who's trying to break into a uh, rich man's club. Uh, or, so he's modern, but what's modern in 1860 is not modern in 1875. And so there's a constant kind of one-upmanship. Even Dwayne, who's super modern, but is also, he's old fashioned in the fact that he, his showmanship is not modern. It's like, he loves the show, which is more like bourgeoisie. I don't know whether you, how familiar you are with anatomical representation, but bourgeoisie in uh, mid 19th century was this fantastically beautiful eight volume surgical anatomy with a gifted artist, uh, uh, Jacques who's trained by Jacques Louis uh, Gavin, classicism, the skinny, beautiful, beautiful woman, uh, and you know, beautiful men being shown in these pictures. The anatomical subjects, were they chosen for their beauty even before that, or did, did they just beautify them on the page? Again, I don't know whether that it's impossible to know that, but that's the question. With photography, you can choose a nice looking side if you probably had access to that. I think Dwayne deliberately chose ugly sides. 
you didn't clearly make a point, is that like the shock in in rest of the Parisian faculty of medicine, and also because it was a kind of oversignification. The rhetoric of the real uh, it's even realer than the show Argo in that regard. But on the other hand, it's the Argo body that supplies the agent. Yeah, thank you, Michael, for this wonderful um, presentation. Um, my question is, um, it also has to do with Dorian's uh, work, but in terms of uh, the circulation of images, of uh, we already know that some of his medical films were shown in, pure, in some popular shares and many like and in the they were exhibited in those one kind of uh, shares or pop well, popular shares. And I, I would like to know if, um, if his uh, photographs uh, have this kind of destiny as well. I mean, um, you have shown us uh, those um, examples of uh, himself being uh, portrayed in the Grand Guignol and, and, and in some satirical uh, magazines, but uh, were uh, the images he produced uh, circulated in, you know, like this uh, underground uh, sort of um, cir uh, exhibited one. Yeah, I wish I knew. Uh, uh, now, the story that you refer to is, is, is a kind of become a classic story in the history of medical motion pictures, is that Wyand did a surgery to separate Siamese twins. It's said, now I think maybe recent research has shown that maybe the story is not quite as true, that his assistant got a copy of the film and sold it to fairground carnival operators who then showed this, and this was a big scandal that this should have stayed within the domain of you know, professional circula, in other words, only be seen by uh, medical professionals and medical fans, uh, and it was shown to the public. Uh, clearly, you know, if he's appearing on the front page of satirical weeklies, people know that he's doing this stuff, since the motion pictures are recorded on, I don't know how many people saw Wyand's motion pictures. And it's unclear whether that story is even true. But it becomes a legend, and now he gives these lectures out after, he, after the riot. It's said, and again, I, I'm just starting the research. I don't really know the details of it. Um, it's said that he gives these lectures to, and these lectures are sort of for medical students, but also open to the public, I think. And uh, we can speak in a big auditorium and we can see these sounds and then the, the expectation is that people are gonna come. His publications are really technical. On the other hand, that anatomical, uh, the ones I've shown of the anatomical guillotining, or that's printed on the cheapest paper imaginable. So the question is, what was the print run? How was it circulated? Did people sort of think, I'm just gonna buy this sort of like the way you buy pornography stock today or something. You don't wanna show your kids or you know, like that, uh, uh, you know, the, the way people might buy uh, uh, horror sensationalist novels or spooky things. I don't know. I don't know how many people in the Grand Guignol, uh, the Grand Guignol itself, they, they put on five or so short plays in the evening. There's lots of stage blood, usually some farces. Uh, often has the figure of a sadistic doctor, cameraman. Most of those plays have not been printed or written in French, and certainly very few translated into other languages. Wyand, some of those have been modeled almost directly on Wyand. Cartoons suggest that, as they said, the same artist who satirizes YN also does posters for the Grand Guignol. So I don't know that question. Uh, but I mean, in later on in the 1920s in the British uh, Hygiene Museum and in the 1930s in the Chicago World's Fair and uh, in the New York World's Fair and in the 
Library of Congress. They do have large exhibits on kind of uh, of photographs and like that and talk about cross section and that kind of thing. So it's considered to be not. I mean, they're just mixed in with data with other kinds of representation or that kind of a model. Giant uh, X-ray viewers and stuff like that, and all kinds of other things. But it's considered to be you know part of the ensemble of medical modernity. Uh, but they, those are not really they were really kind of not considered as uh, as artistic viewpoints as far as I know. Uh, I mean, all, in all of these images, they That's something that goes into it. Uh, I don't think it's adequately been written about in the Museum of Anatomical Institution, but um, that costume that kind of comes with it is an interesting one. But um, the question of uh, these kind of contemporary sources is not really part. But some th and a lot of the transcendent perception of the work or way of treating it in relation to other kinds of representation outside of medicine is hard to know. I mean, people don't articulate, even like your uh, McClellan or Lydia or Wyan, you just don't see the medical press or the kind of reviews of what people say about it. They're, they're not terribly enlightened. In terms of uh, monography, I, I, I wonder why uh, you, you haven't uh, shown us uh, any, any, any picture, any atlas um, about uh, the, the interaction of each row uh, of pho photographing the, the, the human anatomy from, from this perspective, the each row uh, photograph machine. That's, that's a, a very good question. thought a lot about it, uh, and I obviously have a limited amount of time, and I'm going to cram a lot into this talk. I think that the literature on 19th century anatomy has now given a kind of distorted impression of uh, overemphasized racial anatomy within, you know, racial anatomy is very important, and obviously you need to have the legacy and some terrible things that you can you can have over. But I, this stuff here has very little to do with eugenics or racial anatomy. Rudiger himself, I was disappointed to know, was a great opponent of the admission of women. And he was someone who struggled to be become a medical professor and was a poor boy. In the 1880s, there was a debate in Germany about whether women should be admitted to medical schools in this country. And against it, but there's nothing in his, uh, uh, such as an anatomical work that's about, I'm going to use a photograph to show the inferiority. Uh, now, there is a lot of photographic anatomy, uh, racial anatomy, and I've, I left it out. I, when I first did this talk, I was going to do the kind of varieties of photographic anatomical experiences. The more I learned, the more, the bigger the experience came, and then I said, well, I can't show everything. But uh, there's in the um, 18 in 1878, Francis Galton invents composite photography, uh, which is used in criminology and racial anatomy. And there is some interest in doing composite photography of skulls to to do it uh, to show a racial type. So John Shaw Billings, who's one of the founders of the National Library of Medicine, where I work, has a has a photographic anatomy project where he takes 10 skulls. Of of one particular Native American tribe and he 
superimposes them on, on top of each other. Creates a beautiful image that's supposedly the average, the typical, you know, the type of the racial type of the image. But that's not it just sort of doesn't seem to play out much. And and Gustav Bresius, who's of course the big Swedish uh, uh, comparative anatomist and neuroanatomist, uh, contemporary of Harvard and Jean Paul, uh, he also has comparative anatomy of skulls, both uh, uh, from a pathological uh, perspective uh, and, uh, and also uh, comparing different species of primates and also uh, creates this beautiful, beautiful photograph of this uh, show, which do show racial variation and brain injury. The skulls and brains, but uh, interesting is that uh, most of the cases, when I uh, maybe it wasn't clear when I was talking about the universal union of subjects, is that the project for most of, I think, the, the, the great bulk of 19th century uh, anatomical pre-production showing human anatomy uh, was not about racial difference. Now, that I, I omitted. Brian actually does use one black man. He's the man that actually is the, who's getting his erect penis cut from. Um, and uh, I, maybe I should include him, but he's just used as an example of human anatomy. It's not, it's not like saying, look how much Africans differ from this, someone who was living in Paris and was forgot. And, and, and one of the uh, female subjects Fifties. She's got a slight mustache, and they, most people look at her, her, and if they don't look closely, they think it's a man. Uh, again, it's not an it's not an image for pathology or anything of, of, of gender or of gradient uh, in it. It's all about this uh, it's all about human anatomy and what it's like to be a subject. In the same way that uh, this is actually a foundational technology. For Kind of the hidden history of it, of this topographical anatomy, and when they, when the National Library of Medicine gets the visible human and, and uh, the descriptions of the vis the visible human, they put this guy into a textbook. He's got he's in Texas, so he's in San Diego. He's only got one test for that, and he's got tattoos. He's a, you know he's muscular in some ways, but uh, he's got really thick hair. But he's the, he's the visible human. He's not the visible. individual or visible criminal or visible nonsensical man. The visible human has to... So anyway, that's a long-winded answer to say that, uh, I mean, uh, racial anatomy is a very important topic, but uh, we couldn't make our critique of racial anatomy if, if they hadn't been doing some kind of anatomical union of the universal and, and our, of course, people like Frank Bowe and people like Barbara Gay. 